Hello, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we'll just wait for everybody to come in before we get going. Hello, good evening. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Hope you're having a good evening. Hey, good evening, everyone. Hi, everyone. Evening and hello, if you've just joined us, uh, we're just waiting for, for everybody uh, to be in before we get going. Right, okay, and I think we will make a start. Uh, so hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, and a very warm welcome to our online Nature Trek Roadshow. Uh, my name's Barney and I'll be your host for this evening uh, and I'm joining you from just outside of Winchester. Uh, so obviously it's uh, continuing to be a challenging time in the travel industry at the moment. Um, we did have some good news uh, with the government removing the red list which is great um, but of course, uh, things move quickly. Um, and today, with France banning UK visitors, not so great. However, um, we are keeping a close eye on everything all the time. So if you are booked to go with us um, in the next few uh, weeks or months, then rest assured that we are on the case. Um, and our team at the barn uh, are always there and available if you want to ask us any questions at all. However, enough of that. Uh, moving on to tonight, um, we are going to escape to the North Atlantic. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say that I'm joined by uh, operations assistant Matt Ede and tour leader, tour leader, sorry, uh, Tom Barrington. Uh, unfortunately, Sarah is a little bit under the weather this evening, um, so she won't be doing her talk, uh, but luckily uh, Tom will be. Uh, Sarah sends her apologies um, and she's very keen to talk about Wales, which is her favourite subject. Um, but Tom has also been to the Azores, so um, he has very kindly stepped in and will be taking on that talk. Uh, so just to say, before we get going, um, if you have any questions at all, um, just put them in the, the Q&A function um, and we will keep a close eye on those and there'll be a um, session uh, at the end where we will go through those questions. Um, so we've got two talks coming up and then we'll have a, a break at about 8.15 for 10 minutes or so before we get going again. Um, right, okay, so without further ado, uh, Tom, I shall hand over to you. Thank you, Barney, and good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome, and uh, yeah, so let's escape the uh, damp and dreary British winter and uh, head over to the Azores. So just to refresh where the Azores are, they're quite a way out in the Western uh, Atlantic, part of Portugal, so but a long way off the coast of Portugal. Uh, yeah, probably about a third of the way out across towards North America. So it's an archipelago of islands and we have uh, three tours that go to the Azores, uh, two in Pico, which is where the red pincushion is there, and then a third trip to uh, São Miguel, which is uh, the bottom right of your screen. Uh, you can see the capital there, illustrated on the uh, island of São Miguel, Ponta Delgada. Okay, they're very beautiful volcanic islands. Quite a strange scenery in a way. It's sort of a bit like a cross between Hawaii and the Pennines. Uh, a real sort of mixture of uh, sort of grassy mountain-like pastures, but then really rugged volcanic terrain as well. Very lush landscape too, and uh, very fertile as well with the volcanic rocks. It's quite interesting that uh, on San Miguel, which is a trip that I mainly do, it's very self-sufficient. Uh, a lot of the food and uh, things you consume, even the tobacco and tea, for example, in this instance, 
is uh, grown on the grown on the island. So it's it's good to see that that sort of high level of self sufficiency. Uh, one of the specialities is a uh, pineapple as well uh, on the island. So you must try that if you go. And uh, the uh, the the lava fields are very uh, productive for for growing grapes as well. So there's a whole selection of tasty wines. Uh, available to sample sample over there that are hard to get in the UK as well. So uh, yeah, do sample those if you uh, go over there. So let's look underwater then. And you can see that the uh, bathymetry, the underwater topography is very diverse. Some very deep submarine trenches and canyons and the water does shelve away quite rapidly, but it is very variable. And that together with strong currents creates, creates a really rich uh, marine environment uh, full of uh, fish and other food sources for some of the larger marine predators. Okay, so this is the, the basic format for all three of those holidays. Uh, the focus of the tours is the boat trips, which uh, tend to last uh, a half day. We may do two back to back some days or have a half day boat trip and do something else in the afternoon. There's a series of land excursions to interesting places. And then uh, we eat out in different local restaurants. Uh, obviously, fish is pretty amazing over there, but there's lots of other tasty meals, too. The hotels are of a uh, high standard. This is one of my rooms from a couple of years ago where I could uh, scan out and watch the roseate turns from the balcony. And uh, both, uh, both uh, destinations, uh, the hotels have like swimming pools and uh, other nice features. So you're well looked after there. Uh, foods are good fun in on both islands, uh, eating out. This is uh, it's actually a restaurant next to the hotel in San Miguel that we go to each year. And the, the quirky thing at this place is you actually cook your meat, meat and uh, other, other things on, on the charcoal grill that's provided on the table. So it's quite good fun cooking your own sort of indoor barbecue. Another interesting place here, the food is like a, a really rich casserole that's actually made on a on some hot springs. So there's a huge pan there stuffed full of different local meats and vegetables and it's casserole for hours out in the hot springs and then served, uh, carried by hand to the restaurant then served up with uh, jugs of wine. That's quite, it's quite an occasion going there. But what we're, uh, yeah, and uh, well, the lovely places to wander as well, both towns that we stay in on the island, great places to just, uh, wander around, soak up the atmosphere, have a coffee and a, a Portuguese pastry and just watch the world go by. But what we're really interested in is going out on boats and seeing dolphins and whales. And the Azores are the best place in Europe for, for whale and dolphin watching unquestionably. I think about 28 species have been recorded over the, over the years. So on Pico, it's mainly by uh, ribs, these uh, Zodiac boats, the one in the foreground there. But on uh, San Miguel, you've got a choice, really, of either going out on ribs or, or going by catamaran, these bigger, much more comfy boats. So it's, uh, if you're on San Miguel, it's worth doing both. It's a, a different experience being up close and personal on a rib with the extra flexibility that a small boat offers, but then the comfort and height and stability of a bigger vessel. So here are some of the resident species that are almost guaranteed to be seen on each trip if we have good weather. We have the top left, the Risso's dolphin, which has all these uh, scratches on the body surface caused by uh, yeah. sort of uh, fighting between males usually but sometimes it can be attacks from prey as well. And then the common dolphin, top right, occurs in large schools all around the islands. And then a bit more inshore, we have the bottlenose dolphins, another species we tend to see most days on the trips from, uh, 
from both islands. The real star species though, that's resident in the Azores is the uh, gigantic sperm whales, the, the Moby Dick, uh, famous in literature. And uh, it's one of the world's hotspots for this uh, fantastic animal. These deep diving whales that actually feed upside down on uh, giant squid, you know, sort of one, two, three thousand meters below the water surface. It's an incredible feat that these animals can dive and feed uh, at those water depths. So we'd expect to see those at any time of the year, but particularly I think in the summer months, uh, they're, they're usually very easy to see. In the summer, the, uh, the waters are sort of, uh, other, other dolphin species come in the summer things. So we have large schools of Atlantic spotted dolphins. You can see on the left there, the spots of a uh, adult, uh, spotted dolphin and uh, on the right there also gets in the summer the striped dolphin a really beautiful uh, dolphin a uh, really spectacular and acrobatic species to to see in the summer months in these oars the focus of the spring trips is on the the great whales which migrate through the through the Azores to, to polar waters where they spend the uh, summer months to feed on things like Atlantic krill. So it's a really good place to pick up uh, a range of the large rockerel whales, a blue whale in this instance, we uh, usually see on the trips in uh, May, May time in the Azores, but also uh, fin whales as well is uh, one of the animals managed to photograph uh, a couple of years ago, back in 2019. And uh, you can see how close we can get to some of the, these animals. You also get uh, in May from time to time, say whales as well, another rockerel, as well as minke whales, and also humpback I've seen, seen in the Azores as well. So uh, yes, yeah, well worth the trip in both seasons because it's a different suite of uh, dolphins and whales. Not without bird interest, two out at sea. I mentioned uh, top right there, the roseate tern and the Azores is quite an important breeding ground in European terms for this rapidly declining seabird. The, the main species though is the North Atlantic Corius shearwaters, which is the Azores have got the biggest populations of Corius shearwaters in the world. I think it's about a third of the world's population breed in the Azores, as well as this subspecies of the, the of Herringal, the Azorean Herringal, very dark wings and uh, quite bright yellow legs and, and a big gull as well, uh, sort of bigger than our Herringals that we get around the coast of Britain. From time to time we get scarcer seabirds as well, I've seen great sheer waters as well as storm petrels and grey phalarope as well as well as uh, some skewer species. So when we're not at sea, we've, there's various uh, interesting uh, land trips on both islands to see things like under, underground caves, uh, these uh, hot water uh, springs here, these steamy spring areas. Uh, we can visit the, uh, the guys who do the well spotting as well. Some of them are actually ex-whale whalers who have obviously got fantastic eyesight and they sit on land from quite a distance from the seashore with these huge binoculars, spot the whales for the boats and then navigate the boats to the animals. It's quite impressive how they've managed to do it actually from such a distance. But, but you know, these, a lot of these guys have been doing this 30, 40 years or so and are really experienced. So it's, it's great to, uh, to do that on one of the days, as well as visit some of the uh, volcanic lakes and uh, grassland habitats as well, which have specialist species, as well as some of the forest areas as well. So we can see some very interesting wildlife uh, around both uh, islands. Perhaps the standout species is this globally endangered 
bird, top left. Looks like a female bullfinch, but the sexes are the more or less the same. This is the Azores bullfinch, and it's an incredibly rare bird, just found on São Miguel up in the uh, sort of uh, laurel forest there. The Azorean chaffinch, uh, top right, looks very different from ours, doesn't it? That big, powerful, pointed bill and very uh, dark gray, gray blue plumage on the back and that lovely uh, sort of bright greeny brown patch on the mantle as well. It's really striking birds and very different looking to our chaffinches. Of course, being stuck out in the Atlantic so far west, from, it's a very good pay, place to pick up rare birds from North America. And in fact, a number of British bird watchers have holidays in the Azores just to try and find American birds, particularly in the autumn. But over the years, we've seen a really good mix of uh, waifs and strays, particularly from North America. Here's a couple of examples of birds that I've managed to see and photograph. Uh, bottom left here, we've got the semi palmated sandpiper, which was seen on uh, Pico, some nice marshes there that get American waders. And then this pie bill grebe on one of the volcanic lakes on San Miguel. Okay, there's some other goodies as well. Uh, this little tiny dragonfly occurs on Sa San Miguel. It's called the citrine forktail, which is an American species which is colonized. And over on the right, we have uh, the only bat in Europe that uh, flies in the day. It's quite surreal uh, walk, walking around the countryside and seeing sort of flocks of bats flying around. But uh, this animal does because it doesn't have any predators, of course. You'll notice on these oars that this, the landscape looks fantastic for a whole range of wildlife, but it's just so remote that uh, not many species have colonized yet. Okay, thank you. I hope you uh, enjoyed that uh, whistle stop tour of uh, the Azores and it's whetted your appetite uh, for, for a trip in the future. Okay, that's great, Tom. Thank you very much for that. I'll just uh, share my screen and talk to you about Fuerteventura. So, a very good evening, everyone. My name's Matt, and tonight I'm talking to you from Nature Trek headquarters, uh, where I work in the operations team and also deliver talks from time to time. Uh, so, a very good evening. I'm going to talk to you tonight about Fuerteventura. Now, Nature Trek for a few years have been, uh, we have been going to Fuerteventura, and but this is mainly. Um, it's a half trip of Tenerife, uh, but this year we uh, had our very first tour, which just concentrates on Fuerteventura, and that was our the Go Slow tour, and that went around this time last month, which I led with my dad, and um, so it's a very successful tour, and over eight days, it gives you plenty of time uh, to see all see all the different corners of the island, <clears throat> and of course, you see all the wildlife as well. So let's uh, let's. Let's crack on. Okay, so the Sofet Ventura is on the eastern side of the Canary Island archipelago, uh, just south of Lanzarote. And so it's a very uh, long island and it's and the elevation is much lower than all the other surrounding islands as well. So it has a very unique wildlife about it, but also it's very close to mainland Africa. So it's only 60 miles away from Morocco. Um, and so for a bird or a butterfly or a dragonfly, that's really no distance at all. And so these species, that you'll see in the talk a little bit later on, are now starting to colonize on Fuerteventura. So very, so the island is a very exciting place to go to because you just don't know what you're what you're going to find. Okay, firstly, I'm just going to talk about the geology of Fuerteventura because it is quite interesting. Uh, so Fuerteventura is the oldest island in the Canaries, and it was they say it first emerged above sea level around 70 million years ago. Now, since then, weathering has been the dominant process on the island. And because it's the oldest, uh, that's meant that all the, um, all the hilltops have been weathered for longer periods than all the other islands. So this means that the island cannot actually cause or 
um, you know, can't cause its own rainfall. Now the Canaries are, uh, uh, the weather system above the Canaries is called the Azores High, and the high pressures, as we know, they go in a clockwise direction. And so the, the, the pervading wind is a northeasterly wind, and that comes from mainland Africa. So it's also very dry air coming over, and the island also can't make its own rainfall. Um, so it is, in general, a very dry island. It's quite interesting in the north of the island as well. Uh, there are extensive sand dunes which are which are raised up very high. They're, it's quite dramatic scenery, um, and that's because uh, the sand has blown over from the Sahara Desert, which is, as I say, only sixty miles away. So it's a very unique landscape. And of course, where you get these unique landscapes, especially on the islands, you get these unique birds as well. And the Canary Island stone chats. And this bird is the male. So this is uh, endemic to Fretaventura, so it's not found anywhere else in the world, not even on Lanzarote, which is a stone's throw away from Fretaventura in terms of a bird and how far they can fly. So it's quite bizarre that, uh, that Fretaventura has its own unique bird. But there it is, the Canary Island stone chat. And there we go, there's a male again. The females are much plainer on front, uh, whereas the males show this gorgeous gorgeous orangey buff on the breast and underparts. More special birds of the region include Hubara bustards. Now in North Africa, this species has been hunted to not near extinction, but near enough. And Fretaventura is actually the best place now to see this wonderful bird. Um, and in the early morning and in the late evening, small groups gather out on the plains and thankfully for my trip last month, which I led, um, I knew exactly where to go. And it's a superb place to see the bustards and they do show impeccably well as well for a bustard. I'm sure many of you have seen bustards around the world and they are very shy birds, but uh, on Fataventura, they, uh, they do quite well and they can show very nicely indeed. Okay, the African blue tit, this is another bird that many people want to see when they come to the island. It's, it's as you can see, very different from the blue tit we have here in the UK, with its much darker cap and very dark necklace and more white around the head. And the, the vocalization is slightly different as well, but it's a very attractive bird. And this can be, this can be seen in small towns or villages or also in the barrancos. Now, probably everyone's favorite, uh, the cream colored corsa or the corsa family at least, but on Fort Ventura, it is only the cream colored corsa you will see. And these are normally very difficult to find. Uh, they spread out across the sandy plains and without venturing too far, you know, you, you've got to be lucky to see one. But thankfully, um, we uh, encountered a couple on our trip last month from the Go Slow Tour. Um, and this was in the north. It was just along the side of a tarmac road. And they were digging about in the soft sand, so not the hard, crusty ground out on the plains, right by the roadside. And they showed unbelievably well. Um, certainly the best views of any Corsa I've had in the world um, and a, a, a true highlight of the trip. And of course, the Berthelots pipits. Now, this is endemic to the Canaries and Madeira. So it's only found on those islands, which is quite strange for pipits. You know, if you think of the UK pipits, they're highly migratory. They travel vast distances to their breeding or wintering grounds. Yet it's in the Canaries, the Berthelots pipit stays in situ. So it does not fly to mainland Africa even. It's quite incredible. So this is a typical landscape view of the island, and this is what's called a barranco. Uh, so barrancos are basically dry river valleys uh, with small pockets of fresh water and vegetation within. Uh, and this is where most of the birding occurs. Of course, you go to the open plains or the bustards and the courses, but in these barrancos are where the specialities can be found. And it's just another view of the barranco. So you see it's, it's quite lush in certain areas. Like this year when we went, uh, there's had a, there had only been four millimeters of rainfall uh, since July, so it was un, it was very dry. Um, so the wildlife just concentrated in these pockets where fresh water was or small oases um, around the island. So it's quite easy to find the wildlife if you know where to go. 
And this is another typical habitat, uh, nature trek group. This was the group last month, and this is where we were searching for bustards. Um, so beautiful light on the landscape, especially in the early morning and late afternoon. That, those are the best times to see the bustards. You don't want to go searching for them during the day because the heat of the sun and they just go hiding. You may have actually seen in the image of the bustards I showed just now how large the eye was, and that's because they're part, partially nocturnal as well. Okay, other species that you'll see around the island, ruddy shell duck, uh, for example. Um, these are very common where there's fresh water. They don't like salt water, uh, but this is a very attractive duck can be found wherever there's fresh water available. And they're quite raucous in their calls, um, and they can be seen generally with ease across the island. Now these barrancos, they're very good for wading birds, mainly because there's thin, muddy, mar thin, muddy margins. Um, next to the fresh water. And this is where the waders gather because there's not really any other places for them to gather. Um, so black wing stilts, um, this is a typical species that can be seen in Fretaventura. And the hoopoe, uh, of course, everyone's favorite bird, uh, found across Europe, North Africa, uh, but also on the Canaries as well, uh, where, the, where they are a resident species. Um, and again, they can be seen with ease in these barrancos. Trumpeter finches too, uh, not as easy to see, um, especially this year because it was such a dry year, um, they become far less reliable um, and therefore you've got to work a little bit harder to find some, but occasionally you get lucky and here we are, a couple of trumpeter finches came down to drink in one of the freshwater pools, uh, see the lovely bright, bright orange pink conical bill, a uh, wonderful bird. Now, it's also very good for raptors and quite close to our hotel on Fretaventura, um, well, let's say 10 minutes away, is um, a landfill site. Now, don't, please don't be put off. Um, you can't see it, smell it, hear it, um, but there is a landfill site there. And of course, where you get landfill sites, it's also very good for birds of prey. Um, and in this instance, it's Egyptian vultures. Now, I first went to Fretaventura seven years ago and Egyptian vultures were very, hard to find. Um, I think I saw two in a week, uh, whereas last month uh, we saw up to 50 in a week. And that's because the island has put on a feeding program uh, for the vultures to help them out. And their numbers have just gone up and up and up and up. So um, a very positive story there for, for the island. And that's just an adult in flight, a really smart bird, lovely diamond shaped tail and bronzy head and yellow beak, a very smart bird. Not to be confused with the uh, white stork. I hope that wouldn't be confused, but you never know. Uh, of course, you get white storks too as well. They like the landfill site as well, as do a number of gulls. So you get the Atlantis form of yellow leg gull here, um, which is which are very common and pretty much the only gull that you are likely to see. So if you're not a gull lover, Fretaventura is the place for you. Now, a lot of our birding is also done around the coastline, um, and that's where you can see a number of other wading birds. Uh, so, if, for instance, turnstone, ring plover, grey plover, uh, but also the Eurasian wimbrel as well. Um, of course, this, this bird is a summering species to the UK, uh, but because it's because the canaries are that's pretty much on the boundary of where the wintering waders go. Um, you can see them there during the wintering months, um, and very smart they are too. Of course, by the coast, there's also a chance of seeing seabirds. Cory shearwater is by far the commonest seabird that you'll see on the land from Fetaventura. Uh, so, so if you do go, do take a telescope and you'll get some really good views as the birds don't fly too far offshore. Because it's an island, birds normally concentrate towards the island, especially seabirds when they're migrating or flying north. And therefore, you get some really good views of the shearwaters. You can also see Gannets, they are rare, but uh, we did see a gannet last month. Um, and you may even be lucky and see a bulwars petrol or little shearwater if you're very lucky. So well worth taking the scope and seeing what you can find. Okay, so it's not just the birds. So on this go slow tour, of course, there's it's eight days on Fretaventura. So there's plenty of time to discover new areas um, and also admire not just birds, but all the other wildlife that is on the island. And so it's plentiful, it's got 
It's got plentiful dragonflies and butterflies. And I'm sure if you took a moth trap as well, you'll get some interesting species. So we'll start with the dragonflies. This is a red veined darter, now, now resident in southern England, but very common on, on Fetaventura. And you see, see this is a male, it's predominantly red, and you can see the red veins at the base of the inner wing there as well. So very smart species. Now this one, this is a uh, broad scarlet or scarlet darter, a truly superb species um, that is found pretty much around fresh water bodies. Um, and, it's a, and it's a real cracker. Um, scarlet is a, a very good name for it, as this image suggests as well. Um, <laughs> Of course, if you are a keen photographer, this is a great place to come and take photos. Uh, the birds, dragonflies, butterflies, and the landscapes as well um, is uh, superb for photography. Another dragonfly, and one that you can see quite easily here in the UK, uh, and also on Fetaventura, is the Emperor, one of the largest dragonflies in Europe, and uh, a real cracker as well. Now, this is an interesting species. This is the Sahara blue tail damselfly. And it's interesting the fact that in the name, the prefix, it's Sahara. So this species actually resides in North Africa, yet winds have blown it onto Fetaventura. And it's now resident in really good numbers um, around these barrancos and the fresh water bodies. Um, so it just goes just goes to show you just not you don't know what's going to turn up and I've had a friend recently returned and he thinks he's found some excuvia of desert skimmer which again is a North African species so it's really exciting and um, the island is a great place to go to if you're interested in you know in discovering new species or going out to find a rare something um, it really is uh, an exciting island to be on. The Epilay skimmer Another dragonfly that is frequent around freshwater bodies. Um, they're not the easiest one to see. Uh, they're probably the rarest of the uh, smaller dragonflies. Uh, but you know, I'm sure with patience, you'll get one eventually. Uh, of course, with skimmers, they fly always very low. So you get the darters, which tend to fly a bit higher, but the skimmers are always low down, close to the ground. Okay, so we move on to butterflies now. Um, now, for to enter, it doesn't have too many species, uh, especially this time of year when our tours go, um, roughly 10 species. That's, again, as, as you'll see in a minute, that number is ever increasing as uh, new species are being blown over from Africa. So this is a cloud yellow, of course, a very common migrant species across Europe and southern England as well. Now the monarch, this is a, a beautiful species I'm sure you all know about and think, yes, you should see them in Mexico, North America, uh, but a small population now reside on Fuerteventura. And this species has been blown across from the opposite side. So blown across from America and now a population um, can be easily seen on the island. And the plain tiger, a similar looking species to the monarch, and um, pretty much the same size as well, but another striking species. And we actually found the caterpillar of the plain tiger um, on the trip a month ago, um, which looks very much like a swallowtail caterpillar. So um, a really good find, that one. The geranium bronze, um, a species that is very rare in the UK with a handful of records from the, from the past, um, but as you see, um, it's a, a very small butterfly and it has long tails, so very similar to long tail blue. But note the underwing there, how, how different that is from the uh, long tail blue. Now, this species, the uh, Lang short tail blue, this was um, strange because all the time we were there last month, we were thinking, oh, there's quite a few long tail blues around, you know, quite easy easy to identify, but there was something niggling us. So we went home and investigated myself and my dad. Um, who co-led the tour, and it actually turned out that these were Lang's short tail blue, and this was another, another re revelation in the butterfly world, and that Lang's short tail blue had made it onto the Canaries, so another species of North Africa and Southern Europe. Um, so again, it, it you know just goes to show that you're not sure what's going to turn up. Okay, of course, with a nature trek trip, you get the nature trek picnics, and there's plenty of time for picnics on this tour. Uh, and we take you to the very best spots. And here's a spot just south of Bitangkuria, 
a very uh, nice village in the centre of the island. And there's this very remote picnic spot that we found. And uh, that's my dad there with the very long arm uh, pointing towards a great grey shrike. And it was a very tame bird, obviously used to being fed by the locals and tourists. And there he is just there um, with yours truly. But um, a very memorable moment for our group who were out there. Okay, of course, there's uh, amazing scenery on the island and from high up, you get a real perspective of how dry and lunar like the uh, landscape is. A lot of clients on the tour said, you know, you might as well be on the moon, you know, and especially the further south you go, uh, where the lava flows are and increased basalt areas are, and you get to appreciate just how much little life there is down in the south of the island, which is why we concentrate our trip in the north of the island, where there is more life. But we still take a trip down to the south, um, to the southern tip of the island, uh, where there's another great lunch spot and um, a lovely area to walk around with the Atlantic Ocean at your feet. Okay, so this was our hotel last month. Um, and as you can see, it's, um, it's full of greenery and trees. And this lures in a load of species, not just birds, but butterflies and dragonflies as well. And it's uh, just up the Barranco uh, where I've showed most of the species on this trip. So this hotel garden actually acts as a, a luring spot to, to draw in all the birds uh, that head up the Barranco. And this is pretty much where they end up. So each morning um, I was up early with a few clients and we walked around the grounds and we saw a number of wonderful species um one of which was in fact very rare um it was a hawfinch now prior to 2009 there had only been two or three hawfinches on Fuerteventura at all um there's been a few more since since the influx a few years ago but it was still a dramatic find um and and we also saw ring oozel uh, knocking about, burfalots, pipits, hoopoos, Spanish sparrows, uh, the list goes on, laughing doves, and they, they're all found within the garden. So as it is a go slow tour, you're more than welcome to opt out of an afternoon excursion if you wish, and just spend your time wisely wandering the hotel grounds. Just more scenery here, looking down to the village of Betancuria and some coastline spots as well. This was a very nice picnic spot on the edge of the Atlantic in the northwest of the island. And I'm just gonna finish up the talk by talking about a few rare birds that, um, that we saw last month and also I've seen over the years on the island. So first up, this is a short-toed eagle uh, that was found from the hotel grounds actually. It was at a, an extreme distance, hence the poor photo. Uh, but you can just about work out that that is a short-toed eagle with its darkish head and very pale underwing. And again, this is um, a rarity on the island and no doubt would have been blown across from North Africa in the prevailing northeasterly winds and ended up here. Um, so again, you know, just goes to show you're not sure what's going to turn up on your doorstep. Uh, so short-toed eagle, really good bird. And just if you're interested, those are two ravens next to it. Now, Craig Martin, this was this was another good find last month. I um, mean, tell it's a Craig Martin, those wonderful large white spots uh, on the tip of the tail there and the dark ar armpits on the underwing. And this was found one of the Barrancos and it was showing extremely well for the group, just flying around our heads. And again, this was you know, a, a rarity for the island. And it was that rare that um, a guy from Tenerife actually came over and twitched it. But unfortunately, he uh, he dipped. But uh, there we go. You win some, you lose some. But probably in uh, recent years, the most famous bird to have made landfall on Fuerteventura is uh, a dwarf bittern. And this is a species that is found in Central and Southern Africa. So pretty much from West Africa around Liberia, head east um, along the countries that head towards the Congo and then head south down to Botswana. And it's an intra-African migrant. So they follow the rains basically. Uh, and one turned up on Fuerteventura and it stayed there for nine or 10 months. Uh, so I, I went over and saw it because I'd actually been to Namibia and not seen it. Um, so more of a reason to go and see it, but it's um, absolutely wonderful bird. And you know, this really was a wake up call as to what birds can be found on these islands. And since then there's been some other 
wonderful species that have been found that you just wouldn't imagine. So um, Fata Ventura is a very exciting place to go. And if you are interested in our Go Slow in Fata Ventura holiday, those are the dates for you. So it's an eight day tour. Uh, so we've got one in March and then we've got one in November in 2022. So if you would like to inquire on bookings, please either contact myself or Andy Tucker, and we'll be happy to help you out with your inquiries. If not, please feel free to ask any questions, and I'll be here at the end of the webinar to answer them for you. Lovely. So thank you very much for watching. I will join you after the break, uh, where I will take you to Madeira. But for now, I will hand you back to Barney and the start of the break. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Matt. That was fantastic um thank you very much we've had some questions come in uh, but i think we will save those um until till the end um so thanks everybody for that so um yes we'll have a break now and we shall um come back at 8 25 so that's just over 10 minutes time okay and yeah we will see you then very shortly
Right, hello everybody. Uh, sorry. Hello. Okay, right. Uh, I hope you've had a good little break. Um, and we are now back with Matt, who is going to talk about Madeira. So, Matt, without any further ado, all yours. That's great, Barney. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, welcome back everyone and thank you for joining. Hopefully no one's left. Uh, so now I'm going to talk to you on Madeira. Uh, this is a, an, a, a very exciting destination and it's another island based in the North Atlantic. And again, where these islands, these remote islands exist, you also get the unique wildlife that goes along with it. And the bird in the top right corner there is one such and that is the Zeno's petrel, but I will move on to that very shortly. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so this is the same image as I showed in my Fuerteventura presentation. And Madeira is to the north of the Canary Islands, uh, situated a long way from land and far away from any other islands as well. So, so as I said, it does have um, a number of species that are not found found anywhere else in the world. So I'm just going to introduce uh, this new tour. So um, it, it runs in June and it's called the Seabird Extravaganza. And that's because Madeira is such a place. And uh, there's an incredible list of rare seabirds that breed there or can be seen off there. Um, and so I'll put on a tour. It's a, a five day tour in June. Uh, there'll be more details a little bit later on. But this is really to target the seabirds and the land birds and the other wildlife of Madeira. Um, so that's a, a short introduction to this new tour. So zooming in on the island, uh, we first fly into Funchal, which is is on the southern coastline um, and our base for the trip is where the red arrow is on the east of the island uh, at Machico um, and that's the perfect base where our pelagics sail out of. So on this new tour there are three pelagics and they're all in the afternoon uh, from 2 p.m. to roughly around 8 p.m. Um, and they concentrate on finding the sought after seabirds of Madeira. Um, so you're normally out at sea on the north of the island, but we also travel south as well, just to increase our chances of finding, for example, the Zeno's petrol. Of course, Machico is a perfect base as well to venture into the center of the island where the landscapes are absolutely unbelievable. Um, so it's, um, it's a great, great base for our bird watching holiday. So I'm just going to show you this image first. Uh, so we fly into Madeira and to Funchal Airport, and this is actually the runway uh, on stilts. Uh, so there's not really anywhere to build a runway on the island because the sides are so steep sided. So um, they've resorted to building uh, a runway on stilts, but it works and I'm still here today. So please do not worry about that. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly talk about the birds of Madeira. Um, now, now, over 300 species have been recorded on the island. However, only roughly around 47 of those breed on the island. Uh, so it's a, a very small proportion of birds are there. But of course, there are many special birds within that 47. Uh, so there are three endemic breeders, uh, which are true species. So we've got the Zeno's petrel, uh, the Madeiran firecrest, and the Trocas pigeon. Now, the Zeno's petrel, um, it's just an amazing species. I'm going to talk about it in more detail a little bit later on, uh, but they breed high up in the mountains um, and are fairly tricky to see um, at sea or on the land, but I'll come to them in a short bit. A Madeiran firecrest, uh, a delightful little bird, uh, of course very similar to the uh, firecrest we have here in the UK and mainland Europe, uh, but the white doesn't extend beyond the eye, whereas in our firecrest it does, it extends right back. And that became a full species um, in 2003, um, and quite rightly so, because it is very different. And then we have the Trocas pigeon. Um, it's a pigeon, but uh, it is endemic to Madeira, um, and there's an estimated 10,000 pairs that breed on the island. Um, so it's an attractive bird in its own way. And then we have a number of subspecies. Uh, 
this is just a small proportion of those subspecies. I'm not listed them all, but there we have the rock sparrow, uh, grey wagtail, even sparrowhawk, barn owl, the Madeiran chaffinch, and the Madeiran storm petrel was actually formed part of the band rumped storm petrel group. Right, so this is the Zeno's petrel. This is the one bird that lots of birders want to see when they go to Madeira. And the only way of seeing um, in or getting good views of the Zenos is to head out to sea on these special bird watching pelagics, which will be running during this tour in June. Now, it was first described in 1903 um, and is now regarded as one of the rarest breeding seabirds in Europe. And we think there are fewer than 50 pairs, uh, which, if you think of it, that is not many at all. Now, like any seabird, they spend most of their daylight hours out at sea, and then they come back a long time after darkness has fallen, and that is to evade predators such as gulls or skewers. Um, and then they give off these amazing wailing noises, uh, which echo around the mountains. So they breed very high up in the mountain on steep ridges, which I'll show you in a second. And this is where you can head up at midnight. So on this tour, we take you to this highest point and it's only a 10 minute walk from the vehicle. And we stand in a line, um, stand, stand in amongst the mountains and we listen to the waning noises of the Xenos as they come into the island. And it really is one of the most atmospheric birding experiences you can have knowing you're listening to one of the rarest seabirds in Europe. Now, it's quite an interesting call and one that confused many for roughly two to five hundred years. Um, and it was thought that these calls were the, the suffering souls of the shepherds who had died on these mountains. And I quote that. Um, and it was in 1950 when Paul Zeno and later on his son, Frank Zeno, um, they actually recorded the cause of desertus petrol, which is a very similar species. And they went around Madeira uh, because the species was thought now to be extinct. So they went around the island to all the locals say, have you heard this call? And eventually they found someone who had. And this person led them up into the hills, uh, into the mountains. And th there we go. Midnight came and they heard the Zeno's petrol. The Zeno petrol existed. Uh, it's, it's incredibly exciting. And now the numbers are increasing because uh, during the 70s and 80s, there was a terrible problem with rats, uh, but now they have been eradicated and the Zeno's petrol is now doing okay. Obviously the numbers still aren't amazing, but it's stable, which is fantastic. And so I've mentioned the pelagics are certainly the best way in which to see uh, this endangered bird, but you can see them on the, on the midnight walk as well, but obviously the views are not as good. And this is the breeding habitat of the uh, petrel. So as you can see, it's pretty much inaccessible, although researchers do hang off ropes and go into the burrows to ring the uh, chicks. Of course, the adults are out at sea, so there's no disturbance at all, uh, which is great. And as you can see, my friends there on the left, you can actually walk around this area as well, which um, is very dramatic. And this is where you come to stand um, at night to listen to the uh, petrels. And just more dramatic scenery there for you. Um, it really is quite amazing. Very Jurassic Park-like, actually, um, with the clouds rolling over the peaks. Absolutely stunning place. Wonderful. OK, so for our pelagics out of Machico, this is the vessel we are on. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's not very big and it doesn't look very sturdy. But trust me, I've been on this vessel and the seats have their own suspension and the boat has been designed in such a way to cater for bird watchers and to prevent seasickness. Um, it really is a fantastic vessel. And if you do suffer from seasickness and you think, well, oh, you might like to go on this trip, please don't be put off. Um, there's it's a, a great vessel and you get some some very intimate views of all the seabirds and those are the skippers there as well. 
Now, how do we attract the uh, seabirds? No, not with sharks, but we use a frozen bait ball, uh, which gets chucked over the side when we're in our position offshore. And we just follow the bait ball. And as I'm sure you can imagine, it gives off quite a stink, uh, but that stink goes right across the uh, Atlantic uh, to bring in all of these petrels and shearwaters. And of course, uh, you might see a blue shark as well, um, trying to take a few chunks out of the uh, frozen ball of chum. So as we sail out of Michiko, uh, it's a good time to see dolphins in the bottom left corner there. Those are bottlenose dolphins. Uh, they're regularly seen um, around the periphery of the island. And you also get the likes of short-finned pilot whales, maybe spotted dolphins, and also the big boys as well. You get brooders whale and sperm whales as well. But, but these are not guaranteed. They are, they are rare, uh, but you, know, you can see them if you're lucky. And loggerhead turtles as well. They are frequently encountered on the pelagics. So as we sail out, we sail around the eastern tip of the island into the northern segment. And this is where we start to see our first seabirds. So this is the Desertas petrel, a uh, type of pterodroma. And, and as the name suggests, these breed on, on Desertas Island, which is a few miles to the east of Madeira itself. Now, these are very similar looking to the uh, Zeno's petrel. Uh, the most obvious way of telling them apart, the Zeno's petrel have a more of a pale underwing, uh, which we see slightly. And as you can see here in the, in the dessert house, the bill is very thick, uh, whereas in the Zeno's, this one here, uh, the bill is very slim. Uh, and that's the, the key identification of separating the two species. And it's probably a good point now to say that these are all my own photos from my trip there a few years ago. So um, it just gives a, a nice impression of how well the birds show. I'm not a, a great photographer by any means. Um, I just let the camera do the work, uh, but the birds certainly perform very well. Now, Bulwars petrels is another wonderful pelagic species that are seen with some regularity around the islands. They're seen daily, um, not in huge numbers, but you will see them. And they're, they're very hard to capture. They fly very quickly in between the waves, uh, but uh, a wonderful species of the North Atlantic. Corey shearwaters, of course, they're very common. They're the commonest seabirds that you will encounter around, around Madeira. Um, and they show incredibly well. Um, and with these pelagics being late at night, um, so in the late afternoon, um, you get some incredible lighting on the birds, which makes for some excellent wildlife photography. Um, so it's well worth, if you've got a camera, just pop it in a waterproof bag. Then as soon as you're uh, chumming, you, know, you don't move about, you don't get splashed on. And that's when you can get these gripping photos. Now with the abundance of seabirds, you got a good chance of getting a picture of mixing the two together. So on the left here, we've got a white-faced storm petrel, an absolutely amazing bird um, that I'll talk about more in a sec. And on the right here, we have the Madeiran storm petrel, which forms the group of band rump storm petrels. Uh, so it's not a true species in itself, but um, it may as well be. And Desertus petrel there on the right, uh, showing just how large they are compared to Cory Shearwater on the left. Um, that's, a, that's an image I, I really do like. <laughs> okay, so the white-faced storm petrel. Um, so this is another target species that we really want to see when we're off Madeira on our boat. Um, now it's a very widespread species. You could do a pelagic of Japan and see them off there. So they are widespread, but in I mean, the North Atlantic, they're not commonly encountered, but uh, they are now being seen on most trips out of Madeira and they are true elegance. Um, they love paddling on the water and picking up small insects, etc. Or of course, bits of chum. Wilson the storm petrel, uh, this is another great ocean wanderer from the south. They breed around Antarctica, the Antarctic or sub-Antarctic islands, uh, but many do wander as well into the North Atlantic. Um, and if you do pelagics of the city isles, you are more than likely to see Wilson storm petrels as well. So they are very widespread, but um, still not that commonly encountered. So another great species to see there. So that's pretty much it for the seabirds. Um, that's them in a nutshell, but um, really exciting bird watching um, and some of the best 
best pelagics in Europe. So well worth, well worth going on. So now we move on to the land and just before you head out on your pelagics, you're more than likely to see Madeiran wall lizards. Uh, they show extremely well around the harbour. And so with the interior of the island, now the island is actually very lush uh, compared to the Canaries or the Eastern Canaries. Um, and that's again, because the island of Madeira um, is extremely high, you know, it creates its own weather. And so the island is very lush and there's plenty of greenery about. And that means there's plenty to see, not just birds, but butterflies as well. There we go, some wonderful landscapes there, really nice. And there we go, you could almost be in Costa Rica in the Lowell Forest of Madeira, wonderful. And it's in these forests that you're likely to see species such as Madeiran speckled wood. Now don't be fooled, you do get the normal speckled wood on Madeira as well, uh, but the Madeiran speckled wood is a uh, far brighter, more, more browny orange, and uh, the underwing is very chestnutty, it's uh, a very attractive species. Now Madeiran firecrest, here it is. Now this is the endemic breeder, one of the or one of three true endemic breeders on Madeira. And as you can see, as I mentioned earlier, that white doesn't extend beyond the eye, like the uh, common firecrest in the UK. And these are commonly encountered in the, in the lower forests. Just got to know their call, um, and then they'll come down for you. So they show very well indeed. The Madeiran chaffinch, so very much like the Azores chaffinch that Tom showed earlier. Uh, the Madeira. The Madeiran chaffinch looks nothing like the uh, chaffinch we get here in the UK, and I'm sure one day will form its own species. And this is the wonderful pigeon I spoke about, the uh, Trocas pigeon. Uh, again, another endemic found only on Madeira, nowhere else in the world, which I find staggering. I really do. Um, I love endemism. Um, so you can see the Trocas pigeon in the in the forested laurel valleys of Madeira, uh, but you can also see them in the local villages and towns as well. Now, during our new tour in June, uh, there was plenty of time to go searching um, around the villages. You know, if you're interested in culture, for example, you just want a, a coffee out, uh, there's plenty of time to do that as well. And the gray ragtail, that's just an example of the subspecies that uh, you can see on Madeira. Plain swift. Now these are found with most regularity um, around the cities or small towns, and even at the airport. Um, it might be, even be one of the first birds you see when you uh, land on Madeira. And of course, the Berthelot's pipit uh, that you see in the Canaries, and as I mentioned, are only found on Canaries and Madeira. Um, they're not in large numbers in Madeira, but in the drier, steppy areas um, such as this uh, is where you will encounter them. Okay, so I'm just going to go through some landscape photos now of the eastern part of the island. So the majority of this five day trip will be on the eastern half of the island. Um, that's because it's most accessible regions and there's not too much difference from the west. So we stay in a very small area when we go to the island, but the scenery is absolutely wonderful. And here we are back up at the Zeno's petrol colony. Uh, so Again, just the more dramatic landscapes, very Jurassic Park-like. And you know, it's just incredible to think that for two to 500 years ago, you know, the Zeno's petrol was present. And I, just, I just find it absolutely amazing. And this is the uh, pathway that you take. Um, so obviously uh, going there in the dark does look a bit uh, treacherous, but don't worry, it's absolutely fine. Uh, no one has fallen off yet. Um, but of course, during the day, uh, if you are afraid of heights, then you know, it may not be the best idea, um, but just look straight ahead and you'll be absolutely fine. And there we go, that's a rather daunting photo, like the final steps, but uh, no, it does carry on the path uh, to safety. Uh, but again, just uh, another one of you. And I'm gonna end the slideshow or the last scenic shot at least um, on this wonderful view looking east towards the Atlantic and Africa in the very early morning um, on the very peaks of the island. Um, so it really is an amazing island. It's very unique. It's unlike any place I've been to in Europe uh, or probably the world. The uh, the flora is unique. If you're a botanist, this is a wonderful place to go to. Uh, has its own unique birds, butterflies, 
Um, so it really is um, an island you must visit. And you must visit it in June. So there we go. Uh, those are the dates for you. So it's Madeira, a seabird extravaganza, uh, the 20th to the 24th of June. And there is still availability for you if you want to take it. That's me done. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'm now going to hand you to Tom, who I think is going to take you down to Tenerife. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much for listening and over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, Matt. Great stuff. Uh, yeah, I want to go myself, actually. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so now let's uh, go back to the Canaries and go to La Palma and Tenerife. Thank you very much, Matt. That was uh, excellent. OK, yeah. So now it's uh, back to, uh, as I said, La Palma and Tenerife back in the Canary Isles. Just to get your bearings again on the geography, we're off the west coast of Africa. And uh, yeah, Matt showed you Tenerife over in the east. Uh, here I am. There's where the pincushion is, Tenerife. And La Palma is the most most northwesterly island in the archipelago. Tom, Tom, yeah. sorry, this Barney here. Sorry, um, I'm can, I'm not sure you're sharing at the moment. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Brilliant. Real. Thank you. Okay, folks. Sorry. Yep. Yeah bit of uh, teething troubles on the technical side there. So I'll just uh, quickly restart again. We're, we're back in the Canaries to La Palma and Tenerife. And uh, so here's the uh, geography slide showing uh, Tenerife in sort of the middle of the archipelago. And uh, La Palma is the most northwesterly island. So this holiday, it's... Uh, it's a week long holiday, a direct flight from Gatwick. And the focus is uh, out at sea. So we do three, four, four to four and a half hour boat trips. We also do a sunset cruise, which is quite exciting, seeing the caves and the sunset and the activity out at sea. In between, we've got the land excursions. Food wise, we uh, either eat out on the boat, some uh, delicious food provided there or I make the picnics and then we have our eating meals at the hotel. So uh, yeah I've got a good reputation uh, for picnics actually. This is uh, one of mine that Tom Tom Abbott took uh, of one of our picnics in the uh, mountain forest. Okay as I say the focus of this holiday really is out to sea and this is the boat we use, uh, the Fancy 2. Looks quite touristy, doesn't it? Uh, but actually, the skippers are fantastic observers and uh, really dedicated to uh, ensuring we see as much as possible, but also to conserve marine, the marine environment. Uh, if we get, see any litter, they'll pick it up. And uh, yeah, this was uh, one of the trips where they managed to rescue some... Uh, a turtle from all this sort of stuff that was trapped around its uh, legs. You'll notice on that picture there, the boat has two levels. And what we tend to do is get there early, get in the queue first and commandeer that upper level there. So this, uh, so we, you know, although it's a public boat, we tend to uh, end up having the top layer to ourselves. We must look quite intimidating actually with our, binoculars and things but uh, yeah so that gives us a great view at 360 degree view out across the oceans so La Palma is one of the best places in Europe to see the Blainville's beaked whale I originally uh, went to La Palma before setting up this holiday back in 2012 to look for this animal and uh, managed to get brilliant views on that trip and several other ones subsequently. So here's a view of the body and these were literally just sort of logging right by the boat uh, for you know five or ten minutes. Absolutely incredible views of a, a difficult to see animal. It's also one of the best places in Europe to see the rough-toothed dolphin 
which has this incredible synchronous surfacing and these amazing pink lips as well. Uh, really fantastic dolphins. It's a good place to see Broody's whale, usually present uh, on our trip, which is tends to be the end of September, first week in October. And uh, the, I mean, the climate then is very good. Usually it's uh, sunny and in, in the sort of 20s. But what, one thing you will notice about La Palma is an incredible variation in microclimate. You can be getting drenched and, uh, drenched and in dense fog in the Laurel Forest. Go five minutes across the uh, volcanic ridge and it's boiling hot and 30 degrees. I mean, the, the temperature on the uh, car is a bit like a fruit machine. It goes from like 30 to 13, really, in the space of several uh, minutes. So these are some of the other marine animals we can see out, for, out from the boat. Uh, Cuvier's beaked well, we've seen on several occasions. It's a really good place for spotted dolphins, often in uh, schools of hundreds. And we see loggerhead turtles every trip when it's calm, as well as things like uh, a tuna and uh, Atlantic flying fish as well. It's a really good place for those. In fact, on the first holiday we did, we had a professional photographer who came on just uh, primarily to photograph the flying fish. So I think there's a, we've seen about 10 species of whale and dolphin over the years on these trips. It's a really popular trip, actually. We often run sort of two trips, uh, have two groups on, uh, on these tours. Good for seabirds as well. As with the Azores, the main species is the Corey's shearwater in uh, flocks of hundreds on each trip. But also from time to time, we see a number of other sought after species including the top right there, the Little Shearwater. Had some great views of those on these tours. Uh, bottom left, the bull was petrol. And also seen on several occasions, the Great Shearwater, as well as uh, Dark Rump petrol, once Swinnows petrol, and uh, several species of skewer as well, and Caspian gull on one occasion. So yeah, let's pick up some good seabirds, as well as the Corys. What makes this trip though really special and unique in my experience is the ability to go under, below the boat and actually view the animals underwater. And I've never really experienced that before. I've been on glass bottom boats, but in other parts of uh, the Canaries in Europe, but that's usually inshore just or seen a few sort of subtropical fish and things. But as you can see here, we just get wonderful views right by the boat of, uh, in this case, a uh, big, uh, big group of spotted dolphins. But we've also seen rough tooth dolphin underwater, you know, right by the boat again, just meters away. And uh, on one occasion, false killer whale for, uh, you know, just right by the boat, as well as this incredible view of a broody's whale. So these are all my shots just holding a mobile, a trembling mobile phone and just being absolutely amazed. Actually, I only really sort of discovered the underwater part uh, quite late into the trips, but now it's my sort of go-to place when, uh, when the animals appear. So in the past, I've missed uh, beak twirls uh, with similar views to this through, through being, through being uh, on the top deck. So just to show you a couple of videos from underwater, these are some of the tropical fish. Looks like an aquarium, doesn't it? And this is a, this is a feeding frenzy of Corey Shearwaters, spotted dolphins uh, and, uh, and a fish underneath. So this is what we saw above the water, which is pretty exciting. You can see the, the spotted dolphins there and the core is just piling in, obviously lots of food there. But as I say, we can then run down and see, see what's really going on. 
you can see the dolphins here, spotted dolphins carousel in this massive shoal of uh, fish. So yeah, really exciting uh, wildlife watching. So either side of the boat trips, we go to a number of uh, habitats. Here's some laurel forest. So this, uh, what you can see there, the ridge is the central spine of volcanic spine of the island. The east side has a laurel forest and the drier west side has pine forest. There's a number of sought after bird species in these subtropical rainforests. We have an endemic bird on the island, the La Palma blue tit which is quite uh, skulking and secretive, but it's given away often by its, by its call. And it's got a really angry call. It's like a bad tempered uh, blue tit. Yeah, really sort of scolding call. call. Also, Matt mentioned trocast pigeon on Madeira. There's a couple of endemic pigeons to the Canary Isles, only found on the islands in the West that have subtropical forest. So in the middle there, there's the uh, white-tailed laurel pigeon. And on the right, we have the bulls pigeon. And there's the rare birds, but we usually see these in reasonable numbers on the trips in the laurel forest. So my career has mainly been spent on butterflies and uh, the laurel forest has a number of very rare and special species and good abundance of butterflies as well. Uh, this trips, the trips that we've shown you to, uh, tonight are all about sort of qu quality rather than quantity. And so here's some uh, very special and rare species. Top left, we have the La Palma brimstone, which is endemic to the laurel forests on La Palma. And then on the top right, this is the canary large white, another very rare species. I mean, that picture doesn't really do it justice. It's just a really beautiful, striking insect. Bottom left there, the canary red admiral. Really uh, spectacular, very bright red, scarlet red insect, smaller than our red admirals. And then the canary speckle wood. You might be uh, twigging now. It's very easy to become an expert on uh, the canaries. You just put the word canary in front of uh, what looks like a, a sort of European species and you've usually got the right answer. But actually these trips, they're almost like a, a bit like what Matt said. They're almost like an expedition where we get a gathering of very enthusiastic people, often members of the group are specialists in certain groups. And these relatively unexplored islands, we go out and find, you know, things that have ne often never been found before. So as well as a holiday, it feels like an expedition as well. This is another interesting habitat we go to. There's an area in the central part of the island that has these small stony fields. So it's an arid landscape, but there is cattle and sheep grazing. You can see on the right there, those piles of stones. It's a difficult landscape to farm. But on the left there, you can see there's a tree lucerne that's been planted that's used as a forage crop for the cattle and, cattle and sheep. It's a good area for birding. Lots of birdie lots of pipits, the bird top left, as well as the spectacle warbler, that middle bird with the chestnut wings and white eyelids and lots of uh, Sardinian warblers as well in the scrub. Now a bird you probably wouldn't associate with the canaries is the chuff, but actually we can see flocks of two to 300 in these farm areas. It's obviously rich feeding ground for the birds. And also another speciality here, which is very hard to see is the stone curlew. Good for butterflies as well, lots of bath whites. Uh, that's the butterfly on the left, as well as several, uh, we often see several cardinals and then other species like clouded yellows and small coppers. 
Okay, so here's a, a view. There's Tom there from the office, uh, was co-leader on one of the trips with me. And we're looking up the mountains, these uh, periodically wet valleys with uh, dotted with uh, pine trees and scattered scrub. And it's a good habitat for a, a range of wildlife, this. So birds like the Canary Island Chiff Chaff, top left, the Canary Goldcrest, but also more North African species because of the proximity to North Africa. We get butterflies like the plain tiger there, top right. And as Matt mentioned, the Apole skimmer, as well as this butterfly on the, the right that's common throughout the island, the canary blue, very attractive, bright orange and blue insect. So water, fresh water's in short supply on the islands, but there's two sort of artificial habitats that uh, attract a lot of birds. At the southern end of the island, on the pictured on the left here, at Fuencaliente, there's an area of salt pans. And then near the airport, there's a, a small area of gravel pits. So these are magnets for the waders that uh, are a little bit lost, but uh, find the way to the canaries and it provides vital feeding habitat. So birds like the curly sandpiper, top left, sandaling top right, the uh, ring plover, bottom left and little stints. So we get a good selection of waders usually on these in these two habitats. And over the years, we found a couple of rarities as well. So this was the very first trip, actually, the bird on the left in 2013. And uh, uh, myself and uh, the co-leader, we found uh, what we believe was semi-palmated plover. And, uh, but the real clinches were when it flew off calling like a spotted red shank. And we knew then that we'd found an incredibly rare bird. It's actually the sixth record for Spain. Also, light. Uh, the Azores, it gets American, uh, other American waders. In this example here, there's one of the two white rump sandpipers that we've seen over the years. Okay, so we can, uh, we don't have to travel far, a bit like uh, what uh, Matt mentioned for Fuerteventura. Ventura, we can uh, see a lot of interesting wildlife in and around the hotel and uh, in urban er other urban areas and along the coast. So if you don't fancy a swim first thing, you can uh, scan out to sea with, uh, with, with, the, with the guides. And uh, yeah, so there's red rock crabs on the rocky beach there. Always Corey's shearwaters passing by and regularly bottlenose dolphins as well. But we've also seen uh, from the hotel, uh, Broody's whale, Blainville's beaked whale, rough toothed dolphin, and spotted dolphins. Good for a whole range of other wildlife as well. Canaries are common, of course. And we get Spanish sparrows in some of the local villages. It's a good island to see the Barbary falcon, this bird of prey that looks a bit like a peregrine. There's a couple of reliable places that we visit and see this bird. And as we're having a beer doing the log call in the evening, there's usually plain swifts screeching overhead, another endemic bird of the canaries. Scrub and rough ground near the hotel attracts a range of insects, like this tiny bottom left African grass blue. That's a common butterfly in bare areas, in bare, bare ground in urban areas. And of course, uh, the, the monarch butterfly that Matt mentioned is uh, fairly common on the island in urban areas where you've got cultivation and lots of uh, native, uh, sort of, uh, sort of non-native uh, nectar sources, as well as scarlet, scarlet data and red vein data dragonflies. Okay, so my tour is mainly birds, butterflies, and other insects, but there is also a spring tour which uh, also focuses more on the botany side. And there's nearly 900 species of uh, native plant on La Palma, and 
obviously been an island, a number of endemics as well. So if you if I think if you're particularly interested in the botany, perhaps the spring tour is for you. We also see these wonderful dragon trees as well. These are ancient trees that are dotted around the landscape. And here's uh, this famous massive pair of uh, dragon trees here, not too far from the hotel. Okay, just finally then, a couple of slides on Tenerife. So that's part of another longer holiday, slightly longer holiday that includes uh, Fort Ventura and a trip to La Gomera as well. So there's a few very interesting species that uh, that you get on Tenerife that you don't get on La Palma. One of which is the Southern Grey Shrike, which uh, occurs in these dry sort of semi-desert scrubby areas. But the real standout species that you have to visit Tenerife for is the Tenerife Blue Chaffinch. Occurs in mountain uh, forest areas below Mount Tidy. And it's an inc a very, very rare bird, less than 500 individuals in the world, perhaps uh, considerably less than that. So it's a, it's a beautiful finch and well worth the trip over there to see it as part of a bigger holiday. Also, when you cross over from Tenerife to La Gomera, the Straits there is a very rich marine environment. It's a, a really good place to see the short fin pilot whale as well as lots of bottlenose dolphins are usually there. And you stand a good chance, as good a chance as anywhere, of seeing the rare little sheer water. Okay, so hope you've that's given you a bit of a flavor of both the islands, uh, two very exciting and different holidays with a whole suite of uh, specialist endemic and Macronesian species. I'll just uh, end by, uh, just showing you one thing that you can achieve if you come on the La Palma holiday. So it's a unique certificate uh, for the, uh, the few people who've managed to uh, do the banana boat and see Blainville's beaked whale. So I've done uh, seven of these holidays now and only one person's managed this uh, to get this special certificate who's actually now uh, signs off them. So. Uh, it's a lot of fun this holiday, uh, you know, there's a chance to uh, have some serious natural history, but also have a bit of fun as well. So uh, do hope you'll join me on one of these trips uh, in the near future. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. And Matt. Absolutely uh, fascinating. Um, right, okay, so um, we are now going to have a uh, Q&A session, so by all means please do send us uh, some questions. Um, right, so uh, we have had uh, quite a few already, uh, so we'll, we'll just stick with La Palma if that, that's all right, Tom. Um, any, any preference from your point of view between going in spring versus autumn? I know you said spring was better. Yeah, I originally, I'd seen that uh, El Hira and La, La Palma had a number of beat 12 records. I managed to find that out on the internet. So I contacted the skipper and uh, said, I, you know, I really want to see Blainville's and Rough Tooth Dolphin. And uh, he was really nervous, but actually we managed to see them straight away. And it, so, yeah, I think, the, the, the time of year we go in September is really tailored to seeing the beaked whales. But I think if you're more interested in the botany, I'd definitely go in the spring. Okay. But the other right. stuff is, it, you know, it's pretty much year round. The other birds and butterflies are present throughout the seasons. Okay, great. And again, sticking with La Palma, a couple of people, Chris Northwood and uh, Rob Frins, have asked, um, what about the volcano? Um, obviously, mega eruptions on La Palma. Um, yeah, that was very unfo incredibly unfortunate, really. We were all set to go, and uh, just the Sunday before the trip, it decided to erupt for the first time since 1971. So really bad timing. Uh, thankfully, there hasn't been any 
any fatalities as far as I'm aware. Obviously, uh, big damage to the island. So, I mean, we're really keen to get back and support the the tourism industry there and the, the boats. I mean, the, the boat trips are going again, the dolphin trips. The volcano stopped. So hopefully by spring, the infrastructure will back be back in place that will allow us to uh, to, to, to get out there. Yes, yeah, I mean, yeah. it certainly doesn't, we, we would certainly be able to go straight to Tazacorte where we get the boat trips from without, you know, n- now in effect, uh, but uh, be good for the island to sort of have time to sort itself out for next spring yeah, and uh, yeah, get back absolutely. out there and, and things will be more fully back in place. Mm-hmm. Do, we, do we know if any of the habitat has been compromised or? Uh, not, not really. No, it's the, the the eruptions were in the southwest part of the island. So, I mean, I th- you know, there's obviously local losses of uh, a bit of habitat for canaries and uh, Sardinian warblers and chiff chaffs. But generally, the most important habitats are the, I suppose, the areas of farmland and the laurel forest. And uh, so they're completely unaffected. None of the wetlands were damaged either. So from from a wildlife point of view, quite lucky in a way that the the effect the damage will will have been minimal yeah okay good good um matt uh somebody asked us earlier about uh reptiles on fuerteventura yeah it's very limited on fuerteventura uh there's probably two lizard species and one gecko and the east atlantic gecko uh, the Atlantic lizard, and there is another lizard which I'm not quite sure the name of. But um, in terms of reptiles, it's very small numbers, probably not breaking double figures, but three that I know of, and two that you're very likely to see on the on the Go Slow tour. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, and that brings us nicely actually onto the next question, which was how do Go Slow tours differ um, from our standard ones? Um, so those there there are a few differences I would say. Uh, the first is that um, we just have the one hotel uh, where you stay at for the week. I think there's one trip where there not might be two, but for the most part it's one hotel, and we always try and uh, have a pool there as well. Um, and then the uh, start times and finish times for the days are, are a little bit um, you know uh, later and earlier compared to our regular trips. So obviously we do want you to see as much wildlife as possible, but um, on those trips, uh, it's just as much about taking it easy, a bit of relaxation. Um, and we also include uh, some more cultural aspects um, as well. And they, they've been really popular. I think we started them a few years ago now. And um, yeah, they just go from strength to strength. Um, we, we keep adding them and they, they keep booking up. People really like them. So um, we're, we're pleased for that. And uh, I hope that uh, explains the, the differences. Um, okay. And also Madeira, Matt, do we, I think we have, um, you mentioned about the botany right at the end of your trip. I think we yes. also, we do have a botany tour as well, don't we? That's right. Yes. It's called the Floating Garden. Um, it's a tour that, that Andy, Tucker managers. Um, so it's a tour that I don't actually know too much about, um, but it certainly concentrates on on the botany of the island. Um, it's an exceptional island for botany. Um, orchids, if you're into your orchids, are a wonderful place to go. And of course, the Lowell forests have their own unique species as well. So um, yeah, it's a great place to go to for the botany side of things as yeah. well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that that one uh next year goes on the 7th of june for a week uh, and there's still availability uh, on that for those people um okay great um tom um which was uh this is from catherine dodd what which was the hotel on la palma you were viewing the sea next to the pool yeah well both hotels have pools right by the sea so we in the early years we stayed on the west side of the island, but now we stay nearer to the airport. Uh, both desti- both hotels have their own advantages and and disadvantages, but we settled on the east because uh, it's a bit nearer to get to the laurel forest. But 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 both are good for sea watching and uh, swimming before before and after trips. 
it's uh it's almost like a go slow this trip to be honest there's plenty of time to uh, chill out with a beer by the pool and uh, watch the world go by so okay yeah. okay Do you, um so Catherine was on the trip in 2019 um do you yeah that the hotel? yeah that well i can't remember the name actually but it's uh, h10 tarobente yeah that's it h10 yeah that's it on the east yeah. side of the island yeah right thank you right okay excellent um and i mean what's really what what do we think the best time of year um to visit the the canaries is so Fred Ventura, I would say to avoid the heat, and this probably goes for most of the islands, um, it's a great place for winter sun, as we all know, um, and the wildlife is there as well. So I would certainly say any time between October, November, March and April, and of course you also avoid the uh, the main tourist crowds as well um, during those times. Uh, but yes, the wildlife is there in abundance. Um, if you're going for the rare seabirds in Madeira, certainly June, July. Uh, my trip runs in June, so June. Um, and Tom de Palma? Yeah, I think, uh, as I say now, I'd probably go the it's September, October to, for the uh, chance of the beaked whales. And we've seen so many other different cetacean species then. I would definitely uh, go then because the focus of the trip is uh, more towards the uh, marine side because mm. uh, we have quite a few boat trips on that. That's right. It depends on the preference. If you're into your whales and dolphins, then certainly spring to autumn. Um, during the migration months on the Azores, um, you want if you want to see the big whales, it's the migration time in in May time. Yeah. Um, whereas birds, I would say, yeah, certainly the winter months where the temperatures are cooler, uh, but the birds are still about. Yeah, and I think for the Azores, the the greatest cetacean diversity is in the late summer, early autumn period. Mm. Yeah, so if you want to see the, the massive whales, it's uh, the massive migratory whales of spring, but for, for general diversity, I'd go in the autumn. You need to do both, really. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, Tom, um, the, the boat, question from Clive Fremantle. Um, on the boat where you can go and uh, have the views underwater, um, so how how does that work? Presumably there's there's a top deck above. Yeah, so there's a main deck where you can get uh, free soft drinks and beers and coffees that are a euro. So that's where most people sit. Uh, there's a, sh a shaded indoor part, and then there's the forward viewing, and then there's the top deck which offers the best view for spotting things. But then next to the main deck, there's two stairs sets of stairways that go down to the underwater so the access is really easy i mean you can be on the top deck looking at the uh, dolphins and then within less than a minute you're down in the glass bottom area uh, viewing them underwater and you often see them rubbing themselves on the bow of the boat uh, getting rid of sort of sucker fish and parasites and things so mm. the access is very easy from the main deck and is, is it busier underneath when you go down it comes and goes really it you know it's no it's you can always get in there yeah it's uh you know we're pretty adept at uh timing these things we often spot the things first so uh i will sort of uh em impress on people to get down there if i think the animals are going to be underwater yeah. so yeah we're usually first there or or if we're not we can uh, get time you know people give up quite quickly and there is two sides, so, you know, there's plenty of space for, for people. Probably get about 15, 15 or more people down there. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. I hope that answers your question, Clive. Um, another one uh, for the Azores uh, from Pauline. Thanks for this, Pauline. Uh, this is a good one. Um, is it possible to, to snorkel or, or dive? on our Azores chips or, you know, get, get in the water. Yes, I think it is actually. Yeah. yeah. The Futurismo, who are the agents for us, have a whole raft of different types of experience. So it's not part of uh, our scheduled itinerary, but that can certainly be arranged. They, they do do that. Yeah. So that's a possibility. Oh, great. So I just outlined the other 
uh, um, activities that Tom mentioned. Uh, you can do a half day swim with dolphins, you can do a snorkeling tour, um, but you can also do a bird watching tour as well. And this is on, on San Miguel. Uh, so there's plenty of options for you. Um, if you did, for example, want an afternoon off from whales and dolphins and you wanted to stay on dry ground, uh, there are options for you. Yeah, it's a very flexible uh, company. So you can swap your Zodiac trip with the bigger boat or the Zodiac trip with a snorkeling one. So, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of options there and, and uh, we can certainly move things around for, for whatever people want to do individually. Excellent. Good. Uh, Matt, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. I oh, no. <laughs> um, in, in an office chat, you, you mentioned that um, you, did, you did a Twitch uh, to the Canaries. Would, um, would you mind elaborating? Uh, so I believe that was for the Dwarf Bitten, um, which um, I showed in my slides earlier. Yeah. Um, so yes, um, it, it arrived from Africa in, I think, October time. And so it was a bird that I had not seen on my Botswana and, and Namibia trip, private trip, uh, a few years previous, which I, it was a bird I really wanted to see. Um, and then one turned up a photo Ventura, and it was very reliable. So sort of a small bit of winter sun, and I thought, oh, might as well tag a dwarf bit in, in with the uh, journey as well. So, yes, that was my um, twitch to... Uh, <laughs> to, to the canaries but also to enjoy a bit of winter sun and all the other specialities of the island oh, okay. as well yeah, yeah. good good yeah <laughs> somebody uh, i think i've noticed in the comments somebody mentioned about the facilities on the on the book the boats uh, mm -hmm. i can't speak for the photo Ventura, but on the uh, la palma trip the there's a really good momentum to the the food on there as soon as you get on the boat they serve you homemade cake and then uh, it doesn't seem then sort of soft drinks are coming round. They'll serve you soft drinks. And then then before lunch, we get some uh, nice sort of uh, buttered fresh bread with butter, garlic butter. And then this amazing vegetable or fresh tuna soup. And then after that, it's sort of ice creams. And yeah, it's a, it's quite a good feast, actually, on the boat. <laughs> yeah, we seem to be eating in between watching dolphins and seabirds and whales and things. It's really good. It's really good trip, actually. It's good fun. It sounds like one of your picnics, that does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so for Madeira, um, it's not quite as extravagant, I'm sad to say. Although you do get homemade sandwiches. Uh, you do get a bit of cake as well and, uh, and soft drinks. But uh, normally, you know, you just floating about on the crystal clear blue waters and there's birds constantly passing so what normally happens is you set up you throw the frozen ball out the frozen ball of chum out um, and then you eventually get corys coming in and boars petrels and then the storm petrels and then the pterodromas the xenos and the desertus petrels start to arrive um, so there's not as much time for eating i'd maybe like to say who knows but um it's it's a great experience, nonetheless. Good. Um, Tom, just going back to uh, La Cumbra, uh, La Cumbra and, and La Palma. Um, yeah. Clive, uh, I am book, booked to go on the um, on the trip that we had to cancel in September. Yeah. Um, he he's asking if um, if we know it or if if the you know the cetaceans have been deterred at all. If they if there've been less sightings uh, as a result of the volcanic activity, not any. I've not heard any reports to that effect. I mean, there was a worry, wasn't there, that was on the news that when the volcano volcanic ash would hit the water, it would create all this sort of toxic gas and uh, make the water boil. But that didn't really happen. So, and the, you know, the the sort of uh, soot's been with the trade wind has been blown mostly been blown well out to sea so uh, you know fingers crossed and as far as i can tell the marine environment's not been too affected so the yeah so the, the dolphins and whales shouldn't have been too affected thankfully okay. yeah good good um okay i think i think that's that's pretty much all, all the questions we we've had um so i think we'll We'll wrap wrap this up uh, now. So um, yeah, Matt, 
Tom, thank you ever so much for your talks and imparting your, your wisdom and knowledge. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, and thank you to everybody who's joined us at home as well. I hope you have enjoyed it. Um, so we are back on Monday. Uh, Monday night, 7.30, um, we're taking you to Spain, and um, we've got some excellent speakers for that. Uh, so to sign up for that, if you haven't already, uh, is via our website, um, please do. On there, you will also see uh, the rest of uh, the talks that we have planned uh, throughout the winter and going on through to March as well. So um, yeah, please have a look through, and we look forward to you joining us on those so um that's it for now i uh, hope you had a good evening and we'll see you again soon thank you very much everybody thanks everyone bye happy Thank christmas you. goodbye happy christmas bye bye <laughs>